Thank you very much, Jess, and it's lovely uh, to be here with you uh, tonight. Um, and I'm going to be talking about um, a fairly practical question, which is how to ensure that substantial numbers of people with mental health problems benefit from the advances in treatment research. Because sadly, in most countries, that is not the case at the moment. Um, oh, okay. Um, so, uh, the good news is that there really are new prospects for people with mental health problems. Um, and those mainly have arisen from uh, research on psychological treatments. So, over the last three decades, there has been enormous progress. Um, and we now have effective psychological treatments for many mental health problems. In England, we have something called the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, which is charged by the government with looking at the effectiveness for interventions throughout the whole of medicine. And when it thinks there's enough evidence to support a particular treatment, it issues clinical guidance. Could we turn down the volume a bit? I think we've got some feedback. Yeah. Um, and um, starting in 2004, NICE has been issuing guidance on the treatment of mental health conditions. And that guidance says that um, you should offer, as first-line interventions, a range of psychological treatments for depression, for all of the anxiety-related conditions, including post-traumatic stress disorder and obsessive-compulsive disorder, and also for eating disorders. Um, of course, uh, many people are also offered medication, which is also recommended, um, but the psychological treatments are particularly recommended because there's some evidence that they tend to have more sustained effects. People learn new ways of coping with difficulties in the therapy, which they could then apply in the future when things go wrong in life and make them more resilient to future adversity. So that's the idea. Um, and we have a range of different treatments that are recommended. The area that I work in is cognitive behavior therapy. And different, rather specialized versions of cognitive behavior therapy are recommended for depression and all the different anxiety-related conditions. But in depression, we also have quite a number of other treatments that have clear effectiveness. Uh, interpersonal psychotherapy is an example. Um, for those people who are depressed in the context of relationship difficulty and their partner still wants to work with them in the therapy, then uh, some forms of couples therapy can be extremely helpful and they're strongly recommended. Um, also, brief psychodynamic therapy is recommended uh, and also a particular form of counseling. So quite a lot of options for the treatment of depression. Um, and these treatments can be very effective. This slide here is an illustration of this. So um, here, uh, what we've got is along the, the bottom line, a measure of social anxiety. It's called the Leibovitz social anxiety scale. And uh, the sort of cutoff between the clinical and non-clinical range is um, about 30. And this is all the patients in a recent trial that we've conducted of cognitive therapy. Um, and it's how severe the patients were before the start of treatment. And um, as you can see, everyone's in the clinical range. And they vary quite a lot in terms of the overall effectiveness. I think we've got more feedback again. Can you? Could we turn down the volume, please? Um, and uh, uh, they vary from the sort of mild but clinical to the very severe. Um, what I'd like to show you now is what happens when you treat people and what happens to their scores a year after the end of treatment. And you can see the distribution has moved way down to the left into the non-clinical range. 70% of people are fully recovered, and almost everyone else has shown some worthwhile benefit. Although not absolutely everyone, you see in this trial we have three people who are quite severe and ha haven't really improved at all. So we don't have treatments that work for everyone, but these are very potent. Um, and in medicine, we often sort of look at how potent a treatment is by using a number called number needed to treat. So how many people would you need to treat in order to get one extra person to recover? And if you think in medicine, say, of statins, 
to uh, deal with cardiovascular problems. The numbers needed to treat are about 130. Uh, for psychological treatments like this, the numbers needed to treat are less than two. Uh, so compared to some of the widely used interventions in physical medicine, these are very powerful interventions. So that's the good news. But the bad news is that in almost every country in the world, the majority of members of the public don't benefit from these advances. Um, and that is not because um, the public isn't interested. There are 32 uh, surveys of people in different Western countries which have asked people with depression or anxiety problems, if you had a choice between a psychological treatment and a drug treatment, would you have a preference? And if so, what would it be? Of course, some people say, no, I haven't got any preference. Just give me what you recommend. Um, but among the, and some of the people who have a preference say, I'd very much like medication. And in general, they get what they would like. But in a ratio of three to one, people say they'd like psychological treatments. And in no country are psychological treatments more widely available than medication. So the public simply isn't getting what it wants. Um, in the UK, until recently, uh, surveys showed that only 5% of people with anxiety and depression in the community were getting an evidence-based psychological treatment. And that just isn't fair. It isn't right. And the trends are not improving. So here is US data. And this is uh, looking at a sort of 20-year period, uh, a period when there have been big advances in psychological treatments for depression, but no real advances in medication in that period. And what you see is the proportion of people who are having therapy that are having psychotherapy or drug treatments. And you can see that as the psycho more psychotherapies are becoming available, more are being shown to be effective, they're being used less, and medications are being used more. So this is a real problem. So in England, we've been um, involved in an initiative to try and right a wrong and try and change things. Um, it's what we call the Improving Access to Psychological Therapies, or IAT program. And um, it aims to greatly increase the availability of evidence-based psychological therapies. Um, that's those recommended by NICE that you saw on the list. Um, and it takes the view that one reason why they're not available is we simply don't have enough properly trained therapists. So the first part of it is a training exercise. Uh, we aim to train a lot of therapists, uh, new people in the field, but also experienced people who haven't been updated in terms of their skills, um, and then deploy them in specialized treatment centers for depression and anxiety. There's quite a lot of money required to set up these services, so it was really very important that they demonstrate their worth. And so a key feature of these services is that they try and record the clinical outcomes of everyone who has a course of treatment and put that information in the public domain. So if any of you have a smartphone now, if you Google Common Mental Health Disorders Profiles Tool, you can see the outcomes of every single IAP service in England. Uh, it's all in the public domain. And this is very important because it's there to empower the public to see you know, what is it that your precious tax dollars are uh, buying and is it good enough and get people involved in a conversation about how they want to evolve their services. Um, so it's really complete public transparency, something that is very rare in mental health. So before I uh, look at how it's doing, the program, it's now 10 years on, I'd like to say a little bit about how it became established. Big initiatives like this don't have a single uh, route to their development, but a key thing uh, was the clinical guidelines recommending certain psychological treatments. Um, and then, in a rather English way, a cup of tea was important. Um, and so, um, the, uh, the, uh, the man standing next to me uh, in the picture is uh, Richard Layard. He's a, a world-famous economist. And he and I were at a, a conference 
uh, chatting away uh, in the queue for tea. We'd never met before. And he said, well, what do you do? Um, and I said, oh, I'm a psychologist, and I work on psychological treatments. And I said, what do you do? He said, I'm an economist, and I work on employment markets and things like that. But my dad used to be a Jungian analyst, and he was interested in psychological treatments. I guess things have changed a bit since then. But you know, do they work, and are people getting them? And I said, well, yes, they do work, and people aren't really getting them. Uh, and he said, well, why is that? And I said, well, I don't really understand, because the evidence is very strong, establishing their effectiveness. But they don't seem to be uh, picked up uh, as much as we would like. And he said, well, you have tried the economic argument, haven't you? And I said, oh, what's that? And he said something in a polite English way, like, you psychologists, you're all idiots. Um, <laughs> and um, so we then joined in a partnership to put together and lobby the government based on a joint economic and clinical argument for making the treatments more available. There was some fairly organized lobbying. So we wrote a, a pamphlet called The Depression Report, which outlined the key arguments for making tre psychological treatments more widely available. We had a benefactor who very kindly paid for the re report to go in every copy of one of the national newspapers on a Sunday in the summer. Um, and we also worked with patient advocacy groups and asked them, is this what you would like? And they said, yes, very much so. And so they issued their own separate report called We Need to Talk. And they released it three days later in a coordinated campaign so we could try and dominate the media for a week and try and get the government interested. Well, the government was interested. The prime minister at the time was Gordon Brown, uh, so a left-wing government, a Labour administration. And he promised to start the program in a gradual way. And he was good to his word, and it got going. Um, but then we had a change of government to a more centrist one in political terms, uh, a coalition. And you see uh, on that slide uh, David Cameron and Nick Clegg, who uh, ran our coalition. But by that time, we'd collected good outcome data. We'd shown that the program was working. So they agreed to double its scale in the next parliament. We now have uh, swung more to the political right of the spectrum. Uh, Theresa May is our prime minister, a conservative prime minister. And she has just announced a massive further expansion of the program, which is really heartening to see right across the political spectrum support for mental health in this way. Um, and I think the main reason for it is that the public transparency, the, the fact that we collect data and, and show what we achieve. Um, but uh, Richard Layard and I wrote a book. This is the North American version, so it's all in dollars and it's using uh, American economic arguments, uh, which really show that the key arguments that we use to try and persuade the government to do the right thing. Um, and I thought I'd briefly mention some of the key ones. Um, the first is to help our politicians really understand how important mental health problems are. And so this slide from World Health Organization data shows um, the proportion of disability related to health issues in the community as a function of different problems. And you can see that 38% of all disability is to do with mental health problems. That dwarfs the combined disability to do with heart disease, stroke, cancer, lung diseases, and diabetes. And it's more or less as large as the disability linked to all other physical health problems. So it's a massive problem for every Western society. A critical point is also, when is it a problem? So again, this is World Health Organization data. And this is looking at uh, disability. And you can see that if you take the working age population, uh, then the biggest cause of disability is mental health problems. Why is this significant? Well, economically, it is massively significant. It is estimated that for all of our countries, our gross domestic product, so the size of our economy, is shrunk by four percentage points because of failure to treat anxiety and depression. This is a vast amount of money. And because we have effective treatments, it is also an unnecessary waste. 
how is the economy shrunk by depression and anxiety? Well, there are two causes. One is that when people are depressed and they're at work, often their mind is somewhere else. It's on their worries, it's on their preoccupations. And so, of course, they tend to be less productive at work. And that has an adverse effect on the economy. But also, of course, many people find it difficult to hold down a job with a mental health problem. Um, and so both of those effects can be addressed by good treatment, getting people back into employment and also finding them more happy in employment and more productive. So these arguments and many others were put together. Um, and, but the killer point was to argue that um, it actually doesn't cost you any money overall to do the right thing and make these treatments more available. That is because the cost of delivering evidence-based psychological treatments, which at the time we estimated about $900 pounds per patient, $900 per patient, it would be exceeded simply by savings in other physical health care costs. So if you're anxious or depressed, you uh, have many other physical health care costs, uh, unnecessary investigations. If you have a long-term condition like diabetes, it costs 50% more to manage your diabetes than if you weren't depressed. And these costs can be saved by effective treatment. Also, of course, there are broader benefits to the economy, people moving back into work, paying more taxes, reductions in uh, benefits. So each of those exceed the cost of delivering the treatment. So it doubly pays for itself. So if the economy is tight, it's economic madness not to do it. Um, we, that was our calculations at the time. Uh, we weren't far out. It turns out that the cost of delivering the treatment is $947 per patient, and certainly we're getting the benefits that we predicted. So those are the arguments. Where have we got to in the program? So it's been scaling up gradually over 10 years. Um, we haven't finished yet. There's a lot more work to do. So it's a work in progress. But I think it is starting to transform the treatment of anxiety and depression. Um, we now have these specialist psychological therapy services in every area of the country. So there are about 200 of the services. Um, they're treating about 560,000 people every year. Um, we do use a unique system for uh, as, uh, getting people to measure how depressed and anxious they feel, simple measures that they complete every session. And as a consequence of that, we actually have uh, information on how depressed someone was at the beginning and end of treatment on 99% of people who are treated, which is unique worldwide. Um, and of course, that data is published. And what it shows you is that if you take the nation as a whole, um, seven out of every 10 people who are treated in the IAP services uh, show substantial worthwhile clinical improvements. It's actually a 68% rate. And about five out of 10, it's a 53% rate, the improvements are so large that they would be considered fully clinic, uh, recovered. That means at the end of treatment, their depression and their anxiety are below the clinical thresholds. But you probably know that whenever you start measuring outcomes in health, whether it's physical or mental health, once you start looking at it, you see regional variation. Some centers do better than others. And in mental health, that hasn't been observed much up to now because hardly any services publish outcome data. But in this program, of course, it's there, and we do find regional variation. The key thing, of course, when you discover variation is to learn from it and use that learning to improve the performance of the less well-performing services. And that's uh, what's been happening. So um, when the program was, was um, originally described, um, I told the health minister that if we did really well and we trained everyone well, um, we should be able to do about as well as in the research literature. So that would be about uh, 50 percent of people would fully recover, and then you know, two thirds would improve. Um, the civil servants said, "Don't mention that in the announcement, because we may not achieve it." 
but we had a visionary minister and he got up on the national uh, media and said, and 50% of people will recover. So we then all had to try and deliver. And it turned out it wasn't easy. So you see the red line there is the 50% recovery target. And this is the recovery of the whole, in the whole program each year. And you can see we started off at about 40%. And it's been a hard slog to get to that 50%. But we've been there every month for the last 23 months, there or above. So we think we've really cracked it now. And, but there's been a lot of learning, a lot of hard work from everyone involved in the services. And quite a lot of the learning has been to do with analyses of variability in outcomes between different services. Um, and uh, this is an example. So uh, this is uh, recent data, and we look at, say, the, the improvement rate, 68% overall. But you can see we have one service that was down at 33% and several that are up at 85%. So a big difference. You get the same with recovery. But we've learned from that. And what you see below here is the number of services. It says CCG, so that's a clinical uh, commissioning area. So there are about 200 of them in total. And you see the number that were above our target of 50% uh, each year for the last four years, uh, and the number that were we consider very poor performing, below 40%. And you can see that four years ago, we had 47 of the 200 that were in the low performing range. Sorry. But we've now got to the point where we've only got six. So you've been able to take the low performers and give them information, feed them back, support them, so that they all move up to a good level. Um, and this is something you can only do if you have public transparency and you collect mental health data and, and use it. Um, but it, it's really a wonderful thing, I think. Um, so what are some of the findings? Well, uh, we recently published a paper in The Lancet where we uh, looked at variables which predict why one service gets better outcomes than another. There are quite a lot of them, but I want to mention uh, just three uh, that are of particular interest. So the first is the average dose of therapy. So just like with drugs, with psychological treatments, you get a dose-response effect. So some services give a higher average number of sessions than others, and patients really benefit from that. Those services that give a higher average number of sessions get substantially better outcomes. The average is not enormously high. Uh, if you, you look at the sort of curves, the optimal uh, level is about nine to 10 sessions per patient. But of course, some people get less because they recover much earlier, and some people get many more, but that's sort of the average. Um, the other uh, good predictor is how long you have to wait before the start of therapy. And um, you can see that on the next slide. So in the left-hand panel, um, the blue dots are um, each of the different IAP services. So they, and it's, the outcomes that patients achieved in one year. So it's about 7,000 patients represented in each blue dot. And the red line uh, shows the sort of relationship between uh, going up the side, your chance of improving when you have treatment, and along the bottom, the number of days on average that you have to wait for treatment in that service. And what you see is that for the first six weeks or so of waiting, it doesn't really matter how long you wait. You've still got a really good chance of recovering once you start treatment. But after that, when you get given the same treatment, but after a delay, your chance of benefiting goes down substantially. So we think there's a real window of opportunity here. For many people, it's a big deal coming forward for a psychological therapy. You're having to discuss some difficult, painful issues. And it's not always the case that people are ready for doing that work. And it looks as though there's a narrow window of opportunity to get the really best results. And so it's very important that our services try to follow that window. So the UK government has now set every service a target of getting people into treatment within six weeks, simply based on this sort of evidence. Whereas before, we didn't have those targets because we didn't have any evidence support for it. 
Um, now, another effect that you may have noticed that we found was significant was social deprivation. So, as in all countries, we have some areas which are much more socially deprived than others, much lower average incomes than others. And that does, on average, affect the outcomes you get in the services. So, people who live in a more socially deprived area, the overall recovery rates for their services are lower than if you live in a less socially deprived area. Now, when I was a student, there were two ways of thinking about this. One was to say that if you have a lot of social adversity, then psychology can't do much for you. The adverse social circumstances have a big impact on you, which can't be finessed. But the other, more optimistic view, was to say, well, if you live in a socially deprived area, on average, you're deprived of many things, and that might include good quality mental health services. And so you can look at that and see whether that's important, where you can statistically control for the effects of these sort of variables higher up, which are measures of the quality of the service. And when you do that, you find the effect of social deprivation is much weakened. Um, and I really wanted to sh illustrate that um, with a rather interesting example. So on this slide, we have uh, two areas of the country mentioned, uh, which vary enormously in social deprivation, but they're next to each other. So the first is Windsor, Ascot, and Maidenhead. That's where the Queen has her weekend castle, uh, and where the Prime Minister is the local MP. And this is very definitely not socially deprived. Uh, it's one of the lowest social deprivation areas in the whole of the country. But right next to it is Slough, which is very socially deprived. It's one of the highest socially deprived areas in the country. But um, both areas, the mental health provision is by the same high-quality IAP service. And you can see that as a consequence of that, whether you live in Windsor or in Slough, your chance of recovering is much higher than the national average. And although it's not significant, if anything, we might advise the Queen to move to Slough because the recovery rate is that little bit higher. So you really can finesse the effects of social deprivation as long as you ensure that people get top quality services. So this program is a work in progress, but it has attracted quite a lot of interest. The uh, New York Times had a very large uh, article on it last year uh, de de describing it very positively. The Canadians went perhaps slightly over the top and had an article in the Globe and Mail saying, for better mental health care in Canada, look to Britain. Um, I'm not sure that that's entirely right, but um, people have been uh, following it and also getting good results in other countries. So Norway now has 40 IAP services and they're getting results as good as in England using the same principles. Sweden is uh, steaming ahead and so is Australia. And Israel has recently announced a, 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 a pilot uh, pr project for IAPS in Jerusalem. Um, and Canada is moving in that direction. So, of course, the English program has been going on the longest, and so where is it going to go next? Well, uh, there are two sort of commitments that we have uh, from the current government. The first is to continue expanding it, um, because it's still the case that the majority of people with depression and anxiety in the community don't get any treatment. Things have improved a lot, but still the majority are not getting treatment. And so we can expand much more. We're going to focus a lot of the expansion on people who are doubly handicapped, people who have depression and anxiety and also a long-term physical health problem, such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, we know about 40% of the people in the community with anxiety and depression have a long-term physical health problem. But actually, they're underrepresented in treatment services. Maybe because it's just very difficult getting life organized to have an appointment for your physical problem one area of the city and an appointment for your mental health problem somewhere else. And even if you manage to go to both appointments, the one thing you can guarantee 
is that the doctors involved in the two won't talk to each other. So you won't get integrated healthcare. You're treated as a sort of weird Cartesian dualism, something that the philosophers gave up a couple of centuries ago, but in medicine we still seem to persist with. And so we're trying to address that problem by creating what we call integrated IAP services, where you get your physical and mental health care in exactly the same place. So if you've had a heart attack and you're now going through cardiac rehab and you're seeing the nurses who are working on rehabilitation with you and you're depressed, you will also see your psychological therapist in the same place and we will combine the work together. Um, the other thing is to make much more use of digital interventions. Uh, Dr. Wright has been a real pioneer of that work in depression with computerized programs for depression. And they have big advantages because um, if you ask many people with anxiety and depression, when might you ideally like to have your psychological therapy? They tend to say things like nine o'clock on a Thursday evening. And clinics tend not to be open then, but the internet is open then. And so if a lot of the key things you learn in therapy can be delivered in an internet program, with you having support from a therapist, then that allows people to access treatment at a more convenient time for them. And if, of course, these internet programs can be, can be created in a way which makes them as effective as the full face-to-face -face therapy, then that could be a big benefit. And uh, in Dr. Wright's case, he's demonstrated that is true for depression. Um, and we have also demonstrated that is true for a number of anxiety disorders. This is our program for treating social anxiety. Um, and uh, I'll just show you a little video clip which shows you what would happen if you um, uh, had that sort of program, so what's involved in it. The treatment is a series of modules. Some modules are designed for everyone, and some are designed for particular problems that some people have. Your therapist will work with you to make sure that your modules are in line with your needs. At the start, you will have access to four initial modules. Your first module is called Introducing the Treatment. Click on the module name to access the module. This, like the later modules, has been written to help you understand and overcome social anxiety. The pages contain useful information to read, including case examples. There are also boxes to complete and videos to watch which illustrate some key aspects of the therapy. There are also opportunities to hear from people who have already gone through treatment talk about their experiences. You have been allocated an online therapist to support you through the program. To send a secure message to your therapist, first click on Messages on the top menu bar and then click Compose New. You can also read any messages which have been sent to you by your therapist. You will also see a notification of any incoming messages on your dashboard. As therapy progresses, you will be able to make use of the other useful features of the program, such as the experiment section, where you can plan and keep a record of behavioral experiments. Details of this are provided when you come to the relevant modules. You will also learn to make use of the webcam section, which gives you and your therapist the opportunity to plan to speak to some other people as part of your treatment. It also provides the opportunity to practice giving presentations to a virtual audience. Both of these features are completely in your control. Again, more details will be provided when you come to the relevant sections. On the main menu, there is also a library section which holds a collection of all the videos used throughout the program, including this one, and much else. You may watch a video again at any time, simply by clicking on the title. Um, congratulations, you found a really good program, and good luck. And, um, I did spend some evenings working really, really hard, and it was quite tiring, but I knew that it was really, really worthwhile. Um, and it's, 
it's really worthwhile doing the experiments and sometimes the experiments are challenging. Um, but when you see the outcomes and when you test your predictions, it's just incredibly powerful. So it's really worth doing. You will obtain. So um, that's a sort of flavor of the program. How does it do compared to normal sort of face-to-face -face therapy? You come and see your therapist once a week um, for uh, several months. Well, uh, this is a clinical trial where people were randomly allocated either to um, no treatment for a three-month period, so they're on a waiting list, or um, the standard uh, cognitive therapy, that's the blue line, or the green line, which is the internet therapy. And you can see the internet therapy does as well as the standard therapy, but it requires only 20% of the therapist's time. So therapists can treat five times more people with the internet treatment. It is also much more convenient for patients. They're not having to travel to clinics, and they can do it when they would like. A lot of the support, they get a once a week phone call from their therapist, but they, a lot of the support is email messaging in the system. Uh, you can work on the program nine o'clock on Thursday evening. Your therapist will then see what you've done when they come into work the next morning and send you a supportive message and help move you on in the program. Um, so this is really um, an extra option uh, that is very helpful uh, for making treatments more widely available and more convenient um, with this big reduction in therapist time. But it also is probably going to help us advance research much more because one of the big advantages of internet treatment is that you can have tens of thousands of people going through exactly the same treatment and carefully monitoring the outcomes. And that makes it much easier for us to spot the characteristics of those individuals who don't benefit from our existing treatments. We can then bring them into the lab, try and understand what it is that we're not helping with at the moment, look at different ways of intervening, and then we can test them out online by randomly allocating people to the existing internet treatment or the new version. This really takes us to a completely different scale in terms of clinical trials, and is likely to, I think, lead to many further and rapid advances in psychotherapy research in the next decade. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to move slightly beyond traditional anxiety and depression and talk about psychosis um, and show you how some digital interventions are being helpful there as well. So one group of people that we've been uh, particularly concerned about trying to help are people with what you call paranoid psychosis. They're people who believe that if they leave their home, they will be killed, that someone will attack them or harm them in some other way. And they have very extreme beliefs about that. And so it's very difficult for them to engage in conventional treatment for their anxiety problems. They're not keen to come to clinics. And if they do come to clinics, a lot of the work you do with anxiety problems involves getting people into anxiety-provoking situations and learning how to cope with them. But if you're absolutely convinced you're going to be killed when you do that, you're not going to do it. So how can we finesse that problem? Well, what we've been looking at is using virtual reality to do that. Um, and what we do is we get people to go into the sort of environments that they've been unwilling to go into, but in a virtual world. Um, and because they know it's virtual, they're willing to engage with that. And then in the virtual world, you can do all the maneuvers that you would normally do in therapy in the real world. And we can show there that uh, you can fairly quickly reduce people's anxiety in the virtual world. But the question is, does that transfer to the real world? And I can, before answering that, let me show you an example of the virtual reality treatment. So here is someone wearing a virtual reality headset, and you can see on the right-hand side the environment that he's exploring. This is going on an underground train in London, a quite crowded one, uh, and then you see him in a sort of shopping mall, an office environment, both of them ones you would not normally go into. And he's moving around in that environment, exploring it. Um, his fear goes down, 
what happens now when we ask him to go into those places in real life? Well, it turns out, and I was very surprised about this, you get almost perfect transfer. People will then leave their house and go into crowded shops. They will interact with other people. Um, one of our first studies of this uh, here is one where we gave people just one session of virtual reality, so a, a two-hour session, and uh, we tried to get them into some real-life situations uh, before that session, and they were very anxious, and that's the sort of bar on the left-hand side, and then we got them to go back into similar situations after that single session, and you see a big reduction in their anxiety. This is now being scaled up onto a multi-session uh, treatment, and it looks as though it's doing very well. We're in the middle of a trial of it at the moment. Um, and I'd like to... Um, oh. Um, I was going to say, I'd like to show you a patient talking about it. Um, but he seems to have disappeared from there. However, he is here. This, this gives you a flavor for... Uh, the experience of the treatment. It felt very, very real. I mean, sort of, I, I couldn't believe sort of how sort of real it actually sort of uh, seemed. I mean, the, uh, the graphics are uh, absolutely amazing. Um, the, the likeness of the, um, the characters um, were extremely um, lifelike. By doing, by doing this um, um, therapy, it's actually... Um, made things, for me, a lot easier, sort of, in the, um, well, I'll say, in the, in the real world, um, especially sort of going into supermarkets, um, going up lifts, also um, in close proximity to other people. I don't feel as threatened, and I also can sort of, um, um, I, can, I can look them um, sort of in the eye, and it doesn't sort of, um, it doesn't really sort of bother me, so... Uh, as much anymore. So, thank you very much for listening. I hope that's given you a flavor for how potent the most recent psychological treatments are and the great benefits that can be achieved by making them more widely available, but also the problem that all of our societies have, which is solving the problem of making them available. The alternative is medication, and there is never a problem in making that available because the drug companies that do all the important research for developing them obviously put billions of dollars into getting them into the marketplace. But with psychological treatments, the research is funded by charities and uh, national institutes, which have many other calls on their funding, and so really no resources go into getting them into our healthcare system. And that's really the problem that somehow we have to learn how to solve. And I've sort of enticed you with one example of that. Uh, and I hope it's been of interest because the public benefit from solving this problem really is massive. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So there's a range of them. Some of them are things that have been around for a while. Can we turn down the feedback, please? Um, uh, but they hadn't been properly evaluated. And when the evaluations have been done, they've turned out to be effective. Some of them have also turned out to be ineffective. Others are more recent ones. Um, many of them are ver versions of cognitive behavior therapy. Um, that's 
often thought about as a single therapy, but it's actually not. Um, it's a series of very specialized interventions depending on the problem. So for example, if you uh, take uh, social anxiety, which I showed you data on, um, one of the key problems in social anxiety is people have quite distorted images of how they think they come across to other people. They're very worried that other people see they're anxious or I think they're... Can we turn down the volume? Um, or think that um, they come across as boring or stupid. And they have mental images in which they see themselves as if from outside. Um, but those images are very distorted. Uh, if they're worried about blushing, instead of seeing a mild pink on their face when they feel hot in the face, they see in their mind's eye uh, beetroot red uh, with big white globules of sweat on their forehead dripping down behind their glasses and looking very humiliated. And what we find is one of the most potent techniques for dealing with that is video feedback, where you get people to have an interaction with someone else um, and you uh, video the interaction and then before you show it to them, you get them to predict what they think they will see and uh, often close their eyes and visualize what they think they'll see and then compare the reality with uh, what they actually observe. This is auditory feedback. Um, and you know, that's a very potent technique. Um, another key thing in social anxiety is to do with your focus of attention. So people who are socially anxious often say they feel very self-conscious when they're talking to people. They often find themselves, although they're talking to the other person, they're spending all their time watching themselves and, and thinking, how am I coming across? They're sort of lost in their head. And that means, of course, that even if things go well, they won't necessarily notice that, and so they won't benefit from that. And so you also teach people how to shift their focus of attention to get less out of their head and more into the conversation with other people. So those are the sort of rather specialized things you would do with social anxiety. With post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, you wouldn't do any of those things, but you would look very much more at the nature of the trauma memory, and you, you would try and change that. Um, and there are some big advances in understanding the nature of trauma memories, which allow us to have handles on how to deal with it. So let me give you a, a quick example. Um, uh, I uh, saw uh, someone uh, quite recently who was a football fan, uh, soccer rather than American football, uh, and um, she had been involved in a very traumatic event where uh, she'd left the football stadium and had gone into a street and there were some sort of football fans in inverted commas. They um, didn't really go to the matches, but they liked to try and beat people up afterwards. Uh, and um, she, she was going to her car and she found a group of them with, with petrol bombs that they were going to throw to try and provoke the police. And she was trapped between a line of police at one side and the petrol bombers at the other. And so she hid in her car, curled up, and she thought she was going to be burnt alive as these petrol bombs went. Thankfully, she wasn't, but she was haunted by these memories. And she would often suddenly feel very scared for, for no apparent reason, and she felt she was going mad. Um, and when she came along for her first assessment with me, um, she was uh, coming, uh, we were going to sit down at some chairs in my office just over there, and she got part of the way there and then suddenly curled up in a ball like this, absolutely terrified. And she'd gone back into the trauma memory, and, and she was, uh, the key thing about trauma memories is it's like re-experiencing an event, you sort of relive it. And in this case, you know, your body reacts the same way. It's a sort of classic flashback. Um, and then I was talking to her and brought her round, and um, then I said, well, what was happening there? Were you remembering the, the football fans and the riot? And she said, no, I don't know why this happened. And I said, and were you curled up that way in the trauma? And she said, yes, and I felt terrified, but I wasn't remembering the other bits. And this is a classic bit of trauma where you, you get a fragment of the memory without the full thing. And then we looked, well, what was it that was triggering this? Because she couldn't understand it. And it turned out it was a particular color. Um, on the bookshelf, she'd just passed some books which were all a particular shade of blue. And that's the same color as the football strip of the, that the rioters were wearing. So here you see uh, these 
memories being triggered by things which have some sort of vague association with the event, a particular colour, but there's no meaning association. There wasn't anything to do with football there. And so someone who's experiencing that really thinks they're going mad. They think they're just losing control of everything. But because of what we understand about the trauma memories, we know what to look for. We could look for this in her. We could identify it. And then we could use that knowledge to break the link to the memory. So we, we'd then show her lots of different neutral objects, all in that same color, allow them to provoke the trauma memory. And then when she got the memory, to stand up, look around, see that actually she's safe now and do something she couldn't do in the trauma. She was trapped in her vehicle, but instead she'd wander around and do this while she's got the trauma memory. So you see, that's a very different intervention to what you do in social anxiety, but they're both cognitive behavior therapy. But they're very focused on what we understand about the key psychological processes in those two different disorders. Does that make sense? It does, yes. And, and that's part of this uh, pr national program that we had. Um, in order to get the good results, you need to have a, a consistent training program. And uh, we developed a national curriculum that everyone would go through the same training where um, they would have to learn the particular skills necessary for those different treatments. And they would only pass the courses if they demonstrated those skills in videotapes of therapy sessions. Um, and that is really critical to get the best outcomes. Um, and I think one of the other reasons why these treatments are not widely available is that they're widely misunderstood. People think that a psychological treatment is often just seeing someone who's warm and empathic and sympathetic and supportive. Those are all incredibly important features of psychological treatments. But the treatments that get, get the best results have something additional, and that is to do with understanding the extra psychological processes in a particular condition and getting a handle on them, as well as you getting the absolute support that you need and deserve. I am. Yes. So would you recommend the idea? Well, I w we would certainly recommend that you do something similar because we were in the same position 10 years ago. So um, people weren't getting the psychological treatments in general. They were getting medication. Um, but of course, we have a different system. We have a national health care system. So if you finally persuade, in this case, the politicians to do the right thing, then there's a more linear route to implementing it. You, of course, have a system which is very much more insurance-based. Um, but a lot of the economic arguments that we put forward apply the same way. So if you think of an insurance provider um, and you're saying, well, you know, if you provide people with a proper treatment for the mental health problems, then your cost of physical health care for that person are much reduced. That is a very significant point. Uh, of course, a lot of the insurance is also bought by uh, companies and employers, um, employers have a real interest in having an insurance policy that addresses uh, mental health problems because their workforce will be much more productive as a consequence of benefiting from that sort of policy. So I think there are economic drivers within your system which could be used in a similar way. And there are. And I mean, and I mean, one argument that uh, we see in English newspapers is a, is a current one in the U.S. I don't know if the newspapers reported accurately. Uh, is concern about uh, jobs. Uh, 
uh, um, manufacturing jobs and things being done overseas because labor is cheaper overseas and that that's a problem for the economy. But of course, if uh, American workers get access to good mental health treatments, they will be considerably more productive and so the economic equation starts to change. And so there is actually a political imperative for addressing this among the American public, a very critical one, I think. Yes. Yeah, so um, the IAP program has produced a lot of alli alliances that weren't there before. Uh, in our case, it's actually alliances between the sort of professional bodies and the, the voluntary uh, charity bodies. So um, quite a lot of the workers in the mental health charities have become involved in some of these services and they've become co-providers of those services. And that has proved to be a wonderful partnership. Um, it, it, you know, it's more uh, economically viable, but it also ensures that the professionals get very consistent, regular feedback from patients about what they find helpful and what they don't. And it sort of breaks down that boundary between the professionals who know it all, supposedly, and the patients who are just receiving something. It becomes more of a collaboration. So that's been one of the effective partnerships. The other one that's starting to happen for us is partnerships between the uh, National Health Service and companies uh, where they're, you know, co-covering some of these things. Yes. Yes. I think Jess is probably the expert on bipolar rather than me, actually. I'm more of an anxiety. Well, what would you say, Jess? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yes, well, of course, you're absolutely right. Um, therapy involves a, a very important relationship uh, with the therapist, and uh, that doesn't always go as well as one would like. Um, so in the IAP program, one of the things that we publish is not only data on you know, whether people get better or not, but we also address this issue whether some people get worse with psychological therapy. So another measure that we publish is what we call reliable deterioration are people worse at the end of treatment than they were at the beginning? Um, and we see this as a sort of can canary in the mine, if you like, to alert you to services that are maybe not delivering things in an optimal way, perhaps to do with the therapist and the training that they've got. Um, well, so the, the key thing is uh, to report the data. And so far, what we've found is that the reliable deterioration rate in the services 
is actually a lot lower than if people were on a waiting list. So we're not getting much evidence of, of, of positive harm. But you, know, you, ha you have to collect the data and report it and then work on that. Um, but there's a large literature that shows that um, you know, one of the variables that predicts uh, a good uh, clinical outcome is having what you call a good working alliance with your therapist. Um, and that's true in face-to-face -face therapy. The internet therapies that we've just talked about may seem a bit of a challenge to the notion of the importance of therapeutic relationship because obviously there's a lot less therapist contact and it's not face-to-face. -face. Um, and so quite a number of people were quite skeptical about those treatments initially. But uh, what we found in the research studies is that when you get patients and you ask them what they think of their relationship with their remote therapist who's on the phone sometimes or on, on messages, we find that uh, the ratings of the alliance are as strong as um, it would be in face-to-face -face therapy. That's the patient's ratings. If you ask the therapist, they say it's not as strong. They say, I've got a better relationship with my patient if it's face-to-face. -face. But the therapists turn out to be wrong. It's the patients that are right. And why do I say that? Because it's the patient's ratings that predict whether or not they improve, not the therapist's. So this is a, you know, makes us reconsider the therapeutic relationship. And you know, how, how do we think about it? Well, one issue is that quite a lot of people who have um, mental health difficulties uh, have had earlier in life some quite traumatic experience with some significant individuals. And so there's a risk that when you come forward for therapy uh, and you're sharing some of those difficulties, you may feel re-traumatized in that relationship. There's a, a risk that that can happen. And that's why, you know, in psychodynamic treatment at the start, a lot of attention was paid to the therapeutic relationship to try and prevent that from happening. But it may well be that if you're in face-to-face -face contact with pe people uh, very regularly, the therapist has to work very hard to make it very clear that they're very different from some of the difficult people that you might have dealt with earlier in your life. Whereas in the internet treatment, a lot of the key learning is done through what you read on the internet. And the therapist has a somewhat more neutral uh, stance, and it's easier for them to appear that way, given the communication. So it's possible that face-to-face -face therapy creates some environments where the chance of re-traumatization is higher than on internet treatment. And so you have to try and finesse it more robustly. Does that make sense? It's very surprising. It's very surprising. Yes. still massive stigma about mental health problems. Yeah, it's very destructive. Um, but I think things are improving. They could improve at a faster rate. Um, I tend to think of where we are with mental health as similar to where we were with cancer 20 years ago. Um, at that point, you know, many people didn't survive from cancer. The interventions weren't very effective. And people didn't like talking about it. They talked about the big C. Um, but now, of course, we have interventions which can help a lot of people with cancer, particularly if we pick it up earlier on, and the public is generally aware of that. And as a consequence of that, everyone is more willing to talk about it. I think... Yeah. Well, I think the key transformation though, that is starting to happen is people are becoming more aware of the fact that mental health problems are also treatable. And the more the media focuses on that, rather than the drama of a mental health problem, then the more willing people are to talk about it. And it, it is very slow. But there have been some wonderful examples. Um, I think one of the most interesting ones was uh, the Prime Minister of Norway, who became depressed as Prime Minister. 
uh, announced to the nation that he was stepping down to have inpatient treatment, went away and did that, uh, came back and was re-elected. Uh, so... On the internet treatments. Oh, okay. So, so, so the way we do it, and I just can comment on whether it's similar to the way he does it, is um, you still come in for an initial assessment. You actually meet the person who's going to be your therapist. Um, and when you log on to the program, you see a picture of them. You have that one-to-one -one personal relationship with them, but then you know it's delivered remotely. So it's not like it's a complete stranger that you're you're having contact with, you know who they are. And we think that's very important, actually. Um, and there is some research on Skype, actually, which seems to support it. So if you ask people um, who are using Skype to communicate with people in re remote work sites and things, it turns out that they're much more likely to think they're relating to a real person if they've met them once face to face. That seems to be a, a critical point. And so that's built into the way these programs are done. Just a quick comment on that. Uh, our group at the University of Louisville just finished a meta-analysis, which is a compilation of all the research we can find from all around the world that have looked at this question among others. And we found 40 studies on uh, internet-delivered treatment for depression. And one thing that stood out was that uh, if you use the telephone contact versus what you're doing, the voice of the human, Well, thank you for coming out on a very rainy Louisville evening. It's very nice to see you all.